Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our worship service here at Hampstead Baptist Church. We're very excited this morning to have evangelist Rick Vi joining us to share from Philippians 1. So we hope that you're encouraged. If there's any way that we can be of encouragement or service to you, please contact us at the office or call the church, and we would love to talk with you either about how we can be of service to you, how we can serve alongside you, or perhaps you need to know about being saved. Please contact us. We would love to talk with you. In the meanwhile, here's our worship song and uh, evangelist Rick Vi. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our God saves our God saves there is hope you and thank you for the opportunity to be here at Hampstead Baptist Church. You know the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to Hampstead Baptist Church. That's Well, that's a loose translation, all right, but it is good to be with you and I have been here many times over the years. It's a little bit different this time, but it's great to get reconnected with this church family. Let me give you a quick update on our ministry. We just got back from Santa Cruz, Bolivia. I know there are a lot of places we can't go because of COVID, but they were open to us. We were able to go with a mission team, went to the city of Santa Cruz, a city of three million people, many without the Lord Jesus. But God opened doors for us. And, you know, COVID has interrupted a lot of our normal life. But let me tell you what COVID cannot do. It cannot stop the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot stop the advance of God's kingdom, and we were able to share the gospel in parks, in on street corners, in churches, in homes, and dozens and dozens of people were born into the family of God, and you have a part in that through your prayers, your support, your encouragement for our ministry. So I wanted to give you that quick update and then bring you greetings from our family as well. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to call your attention this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to spend a few moments there together. I'm going to begin reading at verse 3. I will read to verse 13. So you follow along in your copy of God's Word. Philippians 1, beginning at verse 
3, this is what the Apostle Paul says to the church at Philippi, inspired by God's Holy Spirit. He writes these words, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Let's take a moment and pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for these moments together that we can gather as the people of God. Lord, that we can celebrate the glorious fact that our sins are forgiven because of the blood shed on the cross that we sang about a while ago. Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for the way they have stood with us, encouraged us, and prayed for us over the years. Lord, we pray that you would raise up the man of God who will lead this congregation in the days ahead. And Lord, that a bright light will shine from this place, carrying the gospel message to the ends of the earth. Now take a simple preacher and some brief moments together, and Lord, write eternal truth on our hearts. For some soul lost in sin, that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, we'll give you the praise in advance, for we ask it all in the mighty, matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You know, when I read that passage of Scripture, I am reminded of an event I read about some years ago. A football coach was giving his team the big pep talk before taking them out on the field. They were playing their crosstown rival, and the coach really wanted his team to play at their best. And so he gave them this pep talk before they would march out on the team, uh, march out on the field. He said to his team, now, there's a particular player I want out on that field tonight. He said, first of all, you know, there's a player who gets out on the field. He gets hit one time. You knock him down. He just lays there, and he misses the rest of the play. And the team said, well, coach, that's not the one you want on the field. He said, no, I don't want him on the field tonight. He said, but then, you know, there's a player who gets out on the field. You hit him. He's knocked down, but he gets back up, back into the play only to get knocked down again. And the team said, well, coach, He's not the one you want out on the field tonight. And the coach said, no, I don't want him either. He said, but then you know. There's a guy who gets out on the field. You knock him down, he gets back up. You knock him down, he gets back up. You knock him down, he gets back up. And every time you knock him down, he gets back up and back into the play. And the team said, well, I coach, that's the man you want out on the field tonight. And the coach said, no, I don't want him either. I want that guy who's knocking everybody down. That's the guy I want out on the field tonight. You know, there are times in our own walk with God that we feel like that player who's been knocked down again and again and again. Could I get an amen in the house? You know, if anyone knew about struggle and difficulty and hardship, it was the man who wrote that passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul would go into a city, preach the gospel, and one of two things would happen. They'd either have a revival or they'd have a riot. And many times they had both. And when the Apostle Paul would go from one city to the next, he didn't check out the local holiday, holiday Inn. No, he checked out the local jail because he knew sooner or later he was going to be there. 
The Apostle Paul knew difficulty and struggle and hardship. And yet in the midst of it all, in this letter to the Philippian church, at least 16 times he uses the word joy or rejoice. And he's writing this from a Roman dungeon. You see, Paul has discovered some spiritual secrets, some anchors for his soul as he deals with the struggles and the adversities that come his way. Now, those spiritual secrets are for all of us. They're not just for the spiritual elite. And in that passage of Scripture, we're going to find some things this morning that will encourage us and strengthen us and be anchors for our soul when we walk through the difficult days. First of all, in that passage of Scripture, Paul will remind us that we always have the presence of God. Now, remember where he's at. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian church from a Roman dungeon. Here is what has happened. They have locked him up. They've thrown away the key. They have left him there to rot and die. They have separated him from his friends, his family, his churches, and his ministry. And yet in the midst of that dark cell, the Apostle Paul would say, I am praying and I'm praying for you. You see, he's turned a prison into a place of prayer. It is where we experience the presence of God. Every one of us have an open invitation to come into the presence of God at any time, any day. A standing open invitation. Now, why is that important? Because every single one of us hunger and thirst for the presence of God. Even those, listen, even those who dismiss the existence of God. They call themselves atheists. I am convinced that there really is no such thing as an atheist. Oh, I know they claim to be. But I believe, according to the Word of God, that no one is truly an atheist. You say, well, preacher, where do you get that from? In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 11, we read this. He says, speaking about our Lord, He has put eternity in our hearts. Inside the heart of every human being, there is a knowing that there is a God who created us. We were created by him and we were created for him. And Paul is saying, look, you may lock me up, you may throw away the key, you may forget I exist, but let me tell you what you will never do. You will never lock me out of the presence of the God I know and love and serve. We've got his presence, folks. Amen. And he has promised that he'll never leave us or never forsake us. And that promise is valid today. I read some years ago about a young seminary student who was preaching and he was pastoring his first church and he was visiting some people in the community. He decided he would visit one of the elderly members who was unable to attend the services. So he walked into her home and he sat down and they had a pleasant visit together before he left. He said, now I want to read a passage of scripture and we'll pray. He picked that passage of scripture in Hebrews 13 where our Lord says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Now he decided that he would impress this dear saint of God with his seminary knowledge of the Greek New Testament. And so he said to her, now dear sister, you need to understand that when the Bible uses the term never, it literally means I will never, no, never, no, never, no, never, no, never leave you or forsake you. That dear saint of God looked at her young preacher and she said, now preacher, the Lord may have to tell you five or six times, but once is good enough for me. You see, that's the promise of God, where of his presence. What an anchor for our soul. But Paul would move on to say, not only do I have his presence through prayer, but I have his promise. You know, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a promise book. God has made so many incredible promises to his people. One of the great ones is found right there in verse 6 when he says, The one who started a good work in you will, don't miss this, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right, preacher, what does that mean? 
Well, you understand, the moment you surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ, the moment you turned from your sins and you embraced the cross and got your name written down in the book of life, when that took place, not only did God save your soul, not only were your sins forgiven, not only was your name recorded in the book of life, but God started a project in you, working in you and on you, until finally and ultimately, you and I will be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What a promise. Now, let me tell you why that promise is important to me. Because to be quite honest with you, there are times that I examine my own spiritual life. And I think I ought to be a lot further down the road than I am. Now, this is not a good place for an amen, all right? But there, there ought to be more Christ-likeness in my life. There ought to be greater amounts of prayer. There ought to be a deeper knowledge of the Word of God. There ought to be more fruitfulness in my life. And sometimes I can look at my spiritual life and say, wow, I am so far from what I ought to be. And then I read the promise. And I can say with confidence and assurance, thank God he's not done yet. Amen. He's not done yet. He's still working in me and on me so I can be everything he created me to be. And guess what? Bless God, he's still working on you too. And that's the promise of God. That's a promise you can take to the bank. What a great promise. My, my wife, if she were here this morning, would say amen to the next statement. I, I am good around the house at starting projects. Some of y'all know where I'm going with this, don't you? I, I can start projects with the best of them. Where, where I fail is finishing those projects. I got half a dozen at the house right now that are still waiting to be completed. I can start them, but I'm not always good at finishing those projects. The truth of our God is what he starts <laughs> Hallelujah, he always finishes. And he will finish the work that he started in you. And we can take that promise to the bank. So here's Paul in the midst of difficulty and struggle and writing from a Roman dungeon, perhaps one of the darkest moments of his life. And he could say, you can't lock me out of the presence of God and you can't take from me his promise that he's going to work in me until I am finally and ultimately like my Lord Jesus Christ. But then he goes on, and he reminds us not only of the presence of God and the promise of God, but he reminds us of the purpose of God. You say, well, where do you find that, Pastor? Well, in verse 12 and verse 13, Paul writes this. I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have actually, watch this, have actually turned out to advance, to further the gospel. Now hold on, wait a minute, time out. What things is he talking about? What things have happened to Paul? Well, we already know. He's been locked up. He's incarcerated. They have thrown him in a prison, separated him from what he we would think was his ministry, traveling, preaching, starting churches, winning souls, advancing God's kingdom. All of that now has been stripped away from him. And yet he still writes the things that have happened to me. Being locked up in this Roman prison has actually turned out to further advance the kingdom. And you've got to wonder, hold on, wait a minute, Paul. How can you, being locked in a Roman prison advance the kingdom of God. You can't travel. You're unable to do what you would normally be doing. How in the world do you, being locked away in a prison, advance the kingdom? Well, he tells us right there in that passage. He says the whole palace guard has now heard the gospel. Actually, 
uh, Bible scholars tell us that it was the Praetorian Guard that Paul was talking about. The Praetorian Guard, this was an elite fighting unit of the Roman army. These were not just Roman soldiers. These were the best of the best. And many of them were assigned to guard the Apostle Paul. Bible scholars tell us that at least for 12 hours at a watch, the Apostle Paul, this great evangelist, soul winner, mighty man of God, would be chained to a number of these Praetorian guards. Now, hold on, wait a minute. What do you suppose Paul's going to be doing for the next 12 hours while these Roman soldiers are chained to him? You see, they think that Paul is their prisoner. (laughs) Oh, no. Paul says, no, no, I'm not your prisoner. You're my prisoner. And now for the next 12 hours, you're going to hear about the grace and mercy of God. You're going to hear about the cross of Jesus. You're going to hear about an empty tomb and a risen Lord and a coming king. You're going to hear the message of repentance and faith and belief. And After a period of time, you know what happens? The Word of God just hammers away on those old hard Roman hearts until finally one of them runs to Paul as he takes his place at his guard and he says, Paul, I'm telling you, I can't stand this anymore. I can't even sleep at night. All I can think about is the judgment to come and I'm a sinner condemned before a holy God and you've got to tell me, Paul, how can I escape the judgment of God and how can I have eternal life? And so Paul leads one of those old hard Roman soldiers to the Lord Jesus. And then another, and then another. Are y'all with me? And then another, and then another, until he can say, why the whole Praetorian Guard and all the rest, they've heard the message of the cross. You can chain up the preacher, but you can't chain up the word of God. I'm about to get excited. You can't chain up the word of God. And Paul says, look, in the midst of this struggle, difficulty, hardship, I've got his presence. I've got his promise. And I can see his purpose, even in this dark time, being fulfilled through my life because of his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And you know, if we were to have a testimony time here this morning, There are some of you who could stand and testify that that's exactly what you've seen God do in your life. Could I get an amen? Some of the hardest times, some of the greatest struggles, and you can look back on them now and say, in the midst of it all, God was doing a work I didn't even understand. God was doing something I didn't see at the time. But now it's so obvious, it's so clear to me that God had a purpose, God had a reason. And God had a plan in every struggle and in every difficulty. Now, let me show you one final. Paul's talking about anchors, those things that secure us during the difficult times. His presence, his promise, his purpose. Finally, his people. In verse 3, again in verse 8, Paul talks about his love for this family of God, these people, his brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank my God, he says, every time I think about you. These were Paul's spiritual children. He had led them, many of them, to faith in Jesus Christ. And the others who had been saved were saved as a result of the church he had planted there. It all referred back to his life and his ministry and his faithfulness. They're his spiritual children. And he's thinking about them as he prays for them. He says in verse 8, I I have you in my my heart. Uh, Some Bible scholars tell us that, that, that Paul seemed to have a deeper love for this particular church perhaps than any other church that he had founded and started. These people mean something to him. Beyond that, they mean everything to him. You know, the truth is, God has given us his church, his family, 
brothers and sisters in Christ to stand with us, to pray for us, to encourage us. And listen, you think about it. You are where you are today in your own walk with God as a result of the people that God has placed in your life. You didn't get where you are all by yourself. Oh, no. God has put specific people in your life over the years who've loved you, prayed for you, invested in you, cared about you, taught you the word of God, led you in worship, stayed beside you through the good times and the bad times. God has put specific people in your life who have brought you to where you are spiritually right now. Some of them you called pastor or deacon or Sunday school teacher or choir member or neighbor or best friend. But God put those people in your life. And we owe them something. Amen. We owe them something. Years ago, I had the privilege of going to Romania right after, right after the Iron Curtain fell. In those early days, we were giving out Bibles on the street, and we were in a country where they had been told for 70 years, there's no God. And now the walls have come down, and we're one of the first teams to go in, and we're out on the streets of Romania giving out Bibles and talking with people about faith in the Lord Jesus. Well, during that week, I stayed with this young couple, What an amazing young couple they were, deeply in love with the Lord. Uh, His name was Emmanuel. What a proper name for a believer. God is with us. Her name was Mary. Now, Mary served as my interpreter. Her English was flawless. Emmanuel, well, he spoke some English, but there were some challenges. Well, every once in a while, when Mary could not serve as my interpreter, I I had to rely on Emmanuel. Well, at the end of that week, we had just such great fellowship, and they had become so dear to me. At the end of every evening, I I would say, Emmanuel, I love you. And Emmanuel would respond back to me, I love you too much. And I thought, that's an odd way to tell someone that you love them. I love you too much. I thought, how in the world do you love somebody too much? Well, finally, at the end of the week, I I took Mary aside and I said, Mary, could, could you explain to me what Emmanuel means? He says, I love you too much. I love you too much. She said, oh, she said, Brother Rick, that's easy. She said, his English is not as good as mine. And Emmanuel doesn't know where to put a comma. He's not saying, I love you too much. He's really saying, I love you too, comma, much. You know, God has put some people in your life who love you too. Amen. And they love you much. And Paul is thinking about these brothers and sisters in Christ who have come to mean so much to him over the years. And even though he is separated from them in distance, he is not separated from them in heart. We need to thank God for the special people he's placed in our lives over the years who have enabled us to become what we are today and what we will become by the grace and mercy of our Lord. What wonderful anchors God has given us during the difficult times to hold us, to secure us, and to enable us to walk with our Lord day by day by day. Could I get an amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we?